Hey, Dumpster Dwellers. We have a special interview with Ted Boas for you today, but if you haven't heard our latest episode, 4 or 5, The Deadly Spawn, make sure you go do that before you jump into this interview. Everyone else, enjoy. Hey, Dumpster Dwellers, we just reviewed The Deadly Spawn, and today we are interviewing writer, director, producer, Ted Boas. How you doing, Ted? Not too bad, and yourself? I'm doing fantastic. Doing good in this age of COVID? Well, I mean, that's how we're doing this interview, right? Exactly. It is an age now. Like, Yeah. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, for coming on here and, uh, and chatting with us, because uh, I'm really excited for this interview, personally. Oh, good. I'm sort of tingled myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. So I guess the, I guess the first place to start would be, uh, you know, I, you've heard this question a bajillion times, I'm sure. But uh, how did you get into filmmaking? Uh, very early on, like everybody, we started out with, you know, Super 8 films. And we just made little short movies. I had a, a friend of mine, uh, a partner uh, in New Jersey a long time ago in the probably the 60s and 70s, Charlie Chuback, And he was also into filmmaking. So we'd get together and make these little uh, Super 8 films with friends. And uh, then from then, I started to do some stuff in 16 millimeter. And finally, I met with um, Don Dohler in Baltimore, and we figured we would, uh, we would do a film. So we worked on things like um, Night Beast and Mind Killer. And then, but it was a nightmare driving to, to, you know, to Baltimore every, every weekend. So I called up John Dodds, uh, who is my friend who does the special effects to the Grog films. And now he's worked on you know major films. And I said, why don't we make our own movie right here in New Jersey, start our own film production company? And he said, that sounds like a great idea. So I started uh, Film Line Communications. And so just, you know, John and myself just put together, uh, we wanted to put together a little monster movie because we figured that would be the best thing to do for sales. You know, at the time you're talking about, this was like 1980. And at that time, you know, gore films and, you know, horror films were, you know, were a big thing and, and video was just starting to come out. So um, uh, that was good. And that was it. So we just started with that. Uh, I came up with a, a short story. Uh, I named it The Deadly Spawn and just wrote a short story. Then we got together and he introduced me to Doug McEwen, who, uh, you know, came on board for the film. And so we just uh, got a film together and just started shooting a film in, in 16 millimeter. And that was probably right around the end of 1980. So we went all through 81 and 82, uh, well, about a year and a half. And then the film actually came out in the theaters in 1983. I think it was April. That's amazing. Um, this this film is near and dear to me, uh, and the three of us are all uh, Jersey boys ourselves. So oh. to have to have uh, this this kind of homegrown horror in our state where we grew up is is pretty amazing. I mean, this film really uh, it was is such an inspiration uh, for me personally as an independent filmmaker too. Uh, what you guys did uh, with the budget and just everything. It, is really miraculous um i gotta say and it still holds up really really well e even now going back to it um i'm always impressed yeah i'm always amazed you know too the people are still looking at this little film i mean again you know people always ask you know they come up with all these budgets which are untrue and and the actual budget was only just under 20 grand it was like 19 something that's incredible uh, uh, uh 20 grand and that's that's for everything you know in, in total and um you know, so yeah, no, we were we were really lucky. You know, we 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 did the film, and uh, you know, we needed um, a little extra money that got us up to the twenty thousand. We needed extra money to finish the film, and I took it to took it around to different studios and uh, small studios, and um, they were interested. But then all of a sudden, uh, my friend said, "You've gotten like five different offers. Why don't we try something? You know, a bigger studio?" And I said, "Okay, let me look around." And at that time. Paramount was in New York. Their main headquarters was in New York. This is before they moved to uh, to California. And so I submit the film to Paramount. They call me in for a meeting and they said, uh, hey, it, it went through the first phase. We're sending, uh, you know, can you get us a 16 millimeter copy? We're going to send it out to California for the final <laughs> approval. And I'm like, oh my God, I got one 16 millimeter copy, which oh, you know, no. <laughs> that's all we could do. So I said, look, I only have one copy of this. I'm going to hand bring it into you you know, make sure they don't worry about it. We'll take care of everything. Uh, brought it into to, to New York. They they 
flew it out to uh, California. And I had to wait like like two weeks. And finally, they gave me the call and they said, yeah, we're sorry. We were, we were pulling for you here in the office. But, you know, they said the film was just a little too rough to be a, a Paramount release. And so they didn't they didn't pick it up. But we came close. It was, uh, you know, it was a shot. That's so, pretty yeah. incredible. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we, were, we were amazed. And, and uh, at that time, also, Troma was interested in the film. And um, RKR, there was a, a number of uh, places that had a, a, an offer in. And uh, we went with 21st Century only because, <laughs> stupidly, again, we're kids. You know, they were a publicly held company. And I thought that carried some weight. Right. And um, so we met with them. They put in an offer that was that was better. And I'm talking to, you know, Mike over at uh, uh, Troma. And I told him, I said, look, if you're going to put in an offer for the film, I said, I already have offers. You're going to have to you know, give some kind of advance. Um, I have an offer on the film. If you don't make me an offer by tomorrow, it's going to be gone. And he just laughed because, yeah, you know, everybody says that. <laughs> This it was true this time. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm I'm telling you the truth. So next day went no no call. I went in with Tim Hildebrandt and uh and John. We went in, we signed the contracts, we got our advance. Our first advance was fifty thousand, which again put us in profit immediately with the first the first payment. Wow. And um and the next day, of course, my calls a troll and goes, Okay, we're serious about this, let's get together and talk about it. I'm like, it's done, it's gone. I said, I told you. <laughs> I wasn't kidding. I wasn't kidding around. He goes, oh, I thought you were just you know, bluffing to try to get the money. I said, I said no, why? Would I do that? Within a day? Come on. <sighs> I would have preferred to have gone with Troma, you know, because sure, they sure. really push their films or whatever. But, you know, they just, you know, so that was that. And, of course, you know, the whole 21st century saga just turned out to be a nightmare. They just turned out to be crooks. Yeah. Unfortunately. Which I found out, you know, you know, the hard way. All, all of a sudden, I mean, we're looking. This is a film that came out. Theatrically, they made about 70 prints. Um, the film came out theatrically and opened up all over the place, all over the world. They would send uh, 10 prints here, 10 prints there, all over the country. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing in Variety, Deadly Spawn makes, you know, 250,000 its first week. And I'm saying, oh, this is, this is phenomenal. And I get a statement from them, and it's, you know, it gives you all these figures. And at the bottom, it says, you know, 50,000. I'm like, 50,000. I, you know, the film was made a lot. I thought I'd get more than that. And then that, that was what I owed them. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> what? With the, well, how they cheated was, is when they send these films out, they, they charge you the, first of all, the prints, right. They, they had to blow, they had to blow it up to 35 millimeter. I had a guy that owned a lab that was, he, he said he would do it for me as a favor for like, uh, I forget what it was at the time, like $200 or something, you know, to, to, for, to, uh, for each print. And of course, they use their guy, which they charge twelve hundred dollars a copy. <laughs> right. Then they charge you to ship it all over. They charge you to store the film. They charge you for all the TV commercials. They charge you for all the newspaper ads. And this was all a charge coming off the thing. And so what they would do is how would how they would cheat? And I found this out because when I went to meet them at the office one time, a disgruntled employee was leaving with an armful of papers. It was cursing, and I said, "This guy has to be working for twenty first." <laughs> So I said, excuse me, do you work for 21st Century? And he goes, he goes, yes, I do. Uh, and I said, well, I'm having a lot of trouble with them and blah, blah, blah. And we started a conversation. He goes, do you have time to sit and have some coffee? And I said, well, I don't drink coffee, but yes, I will. And we sat down and he had all these books and he showed me how, how they cheat. And they just have under the table deals with everyone. So let's say if they would go and make a TV commercial and they charge me $5,000, they'd pay $2,000. And, but they get a receipt for $5,000. If they put an ad in the newspaper and it costs a thousand dollars, they'd get a receipt for two thousand. When they were shipping it all over the place, they would get all these receipts for, you know, crazy money. But that's not what they would be paying. And at the end, I ended up owing them money. Yeah. So it was a, uh, you know, it was a nightmare. So I had, finally had to sue them uh, to, to, uh, you know, I got a lawyer, sued them, put them out of business, and, um, and that was that. It was just, it was just a, it was just a horror story. Oh, jeez. Uh, just real quick before we get into some of the other stuff, do you own the rights again to the film? Uh, well, yes, the, the the rights did come back to me. I just signed off again on uh, Synapse, as you know, did a, a phenomenal uh, transfer of the film for DVD. Yes, yes. Um, very good quality. And then I got involved with another crook, uh, the guy that used to run um, Elite, uh, not Elite, uh, was it Elite? Yeah, Elite. Uh, it was Elite for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this guy came to me and he wanted to release three of my films. He wanted to release uh, Deadly Spawn, Regenerated Man, and Hell on Earth. And so I made a deal with him. 
And all of a sudden he put out the films and just never paid anything. And he said, Hey, I'm having trouble. So it's like, I either, I either pay my mortgage or I pay you. And so what am I going to do? He's in Maine. What am I going to sue him? Sure. So that turned out to be another nightmare. So I got the rights back again and uh, synapse called me and they wanted to do a 4k transfer of the film. So I gave them back uh, the rights again to do that. So they're working right now on a, on their own 4k transfer of the film. So sometime in the future, they're going to be releasing a real, uh, a phenomenal uh, uh, release of it. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, the, 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 I, I I cannot wait for that. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally just found out about it this moment, and I'm like psyched about it. <laughs> oh, good, good. Well, and I told him, I said, we, you know, let's repair some of the uh, uh, the mistakes in the film. Like one point, the soundtrack got screwed up, and they had music where it shouldn't be. And I said, huh. this is all little things that we can, you know, that we can fix. That's so cool. I said, I'll do a new intro, some maybe some new interviews or stuff. We'll, you know, we have plenty of uh, plenty of cool stuff. That's so great. So, so what what is that like coming back to this film? You know, like coming back to this film and saying, "Hey, I can we we could just tweak it just a little bit, just to help being so, like so, it's so far back in your career." You know, what yeah. is it like coming back to it and kind of uh, giving it a new paint job? I should say. People keep coming back to this thing. I don't I don't know why it's it's gotten so many different releases and T shirts and and toys and hand puppets and posters and. You know, it's it's uh, you know, and they're still showing it places. They're still renting it, uh, the thirty five millimeter, and they're showing it in drive ins. They're showing it. We yeah. just had a thing at the whatever it was, some drive in fest. We brought the the movie down there. They showed it in the drive in, and I brought all my stuff and set up tables and sold yeah. out of everything. It was incredible. <laughs> we uh we actually got to meet at that show, the Mahoning. Yeah, yeah, the VHS fest. We got to meet That's at that crazy. show. It's <laughs> yeah, crazy. It's crazy. They're still they're still doing this, and these guys calling me up saying then they released it again on VHS. Yep, like, sure did. Who the hell uses VHS anymore? <laughs> they said you would not believe how many collectors are out there that collect VHS. And I said, whatever. Okay, <laughs> you are talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Joe is one of those yeah, guys. He's got about a thousand VHS in his basement. You're talking to a guy who has a vault, probably. I know. I, it's crazy. I have a guy, I forget his name. He, he contacted me. He bought a bunch of stuff for me. And now he wants me to, he, he says, take a picture of all your VHSs that I have. Cause I have a closet full of these VHSs. <laughs> and he's been buying these, these, these VHS and ridiculous money. I mean, it's, it's crazy. With oh yeah. Some of this stuff. So, you know, I'm happy. Hey, hey, good, good for you. Good for the film. Um, that's amazing. Uh, so we, so, so you mentioned John Dodds and, uh, Tim Hildebrandt a, a little bit before. And, and again, like I, you know, I think a lot of people know this story, but um, what what we what we try to do with the show is kind of reach new people uh, that may not be in the circle of the the horror genre or what have you um, to kind of you know get the, get them some exposure to this stuff. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, what it was like working like with John Dodds and Tim Hildebrandt and how you guys were friends and things like that? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the um, I knew John for for a long time. We had met you know, probably back in the seventies or something. And then, uh, we went to a, con we went to a convention and, uh, Tim and his brother were there and, uh, we just started talking. We found out that we love the exact same things, the exact same type of films and books and, you know, war of the worlds and all this. And, and Tim really said he wanted to make movies even more than, than doing, you know, paintings and, and artwork. Right. So, right, right. Uh, we just hit it off. They were relatively local. And, uh, and that was it. We just turned out to be friends. So when we were going to do this movie, they wanted to be involved. And, you know, we shot at Tim's house. He was one of the executive producers. He uh, did production design. Uh, he did the poster. Uh, so it, it was, uh, it was fantastic. And John, I've known for a long time. We, again, we have similar, you know, interests and, uh, you know, we've been friends ever since. That's so fantastic. Yeah. Uh, John is like one of my favorites, uh, FX guys. So, um, uh, and if, if folks, if you don't know who Tim Hildebrand is or John Dodds, um, if you've seen the star Wars poster or the Barbarella poster, clash of the Titans, clash of the Titans. I mean, he's sacred of Nim, prolific, uh, artist. <laughs> yeah. And Greg, I went to see him, you know, as well. He, he's, uh, you know, he's still active. He's still, he's still doing stuff for, for Marvel and for star, you know, for Disney and everything. Yeah. It's so, so crazy. Un unbelievable unbelievable stuff um so uh, you also mentioned uh don dollar a little bit too um you can you talk a little bit about uh about what it was like like producing uh night beast and and um <laughs> oh, wow whether i whether i really want to get into it or not i have no idea 
Uh, Don was, uh, you know, it was a piece of work again. You know, we were, we were good friends and we, we worked on films together, but you know, Don was one of these guys that, you know, he just wanted to take, you know, the credit for, for, you know, for doing everything. And, um, you know, we started a company and I, and I thought we were going to be partners on things like, you know, at the end of Fiend, I came up with ideas for the stuff which you use for the film, but then he'd never mention it. And I said, well, why didn't you mention it? Oh, well, everybody's giving me ideas. I said, well, I'm supposed to be your partner, you know, whatever. Uh, there were deals I made for him for books and films and stuff. I was supposed to get percentages on that I never got. Um, so it, it's like, you know, he, he was a good friend, you know, at, at the time, but you know, we started to have, you know, we had some difficulties and, you know, and that was that. And, uh, you know, doesn't matter now because, you know, he's gone, but. Well, sure. <laughs> yeah. It's like you win this round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's unfortunate when you get to, when you get together with other creatives and, and, and that kind of, ha- kind of happens, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he had, you know, that kind of problem for, for a while. I mean, people were saying, you know, you owe me money. And, you know, he goes, I have no money. He goes, well, what are you talking about? You just put in a brand new pool in the back of your house. You know, this is, <laughs> He's like, and now I have no money. Yeah. This is all you're doing. So, uh, you know, I mean, what, what's going on? So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you know, again, you, you don't want to say anything, you know, too bad about the guy because he's not here anymore. But, but you know, like anything, you get, like you said, you get a bunch of creative people together and, and you know, stuff happens. Now, this could be off the record or on the record, but uh, my buddy Evan, who Uh-oh. who introduced us, <laughs> are you not a very big fan of Bill Lustig? Oh, jeez. <laughs> wow. <laughs> mentioned that. The and- <laughs> Bill Lustig story. No, no. Again, this is another thing. Bill and I, you know, were friends. He, he was over in New York. Um and he, he was looking uh, to, to get into doing a, a horror thing. And he we talked about it. We, again, went over stuff about a story. And I recommended uh, uh, Tom Savini, who was a friend of mine, for many, many, many years. So, um, you know, I set up that, you know, that deal with, you know, with them. And I was supposed to be part of this project. And then all of a sudden, I don't hear from him for a long time. Tom calls me from New York. He said, I'm shooting this film in New York with this guy, Bill Lust. I go, what? So he invites me to come down the set. I go on the shooting in a subway or something. And, and I said, Bill, I said, what's going on? I, I said, we were supposed to be working on this film. I, you know, introduced you to Tom Savini, everything. Uh, what's, what's happening. We we're supposed to be partner. Oh, 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 you know, you know, well, did you get anything in writing? You know, you oh, know type no. of, yeah. Type of thing. So I just said, look, all right, whatever, you know, so lesson learned, you know, that, that was that. So, uh, when they when it came time for them to sell the movie, which which I think was Maniac or whatever at the time, when they, they came time to sell the movie, um, you know, I told myself I'm getting a lawyer. I said because you know I was supposed to be part of this film and and not, and evidently they didn't want to have any legal problems because they were getting a distribution deal, and if there's a legal problem, they could be problems. So he called me back saying, "Hey, let's you know work this thing out." And I said, "Fine." We talked about it, and I said, "But I want it in writing." And he got all pissed off. And, uh, you know. Oh, jeez. So it's you know one of those things. So you know, but you know, look, I'm not holding a grudge. This is how many years ago? Sure, <laughs> sure. You know, a hundred years ago. So I don't care. We've both gone on to other things. And yeah, no, it was it, it was just that. It was just you know stupid stuff. Sure. You know, again, hey, I'm retired now. I'm doing books, so I'm you know, <laughs> it is what it is. I don't care about this stuff anymore. <laughs> So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the sequels or unofficial sequels thereof, um, Deadly Spawn. So you, we have Metamorphosis, the alien, the alien factor, and the Regenerated Man. Yeah, well, well, Metamorphosis. Well, Metamorphosis was supposed. It was started out as Deadly Spawn two, right? And then Deadly Spawn two, the transformation. Deadly Spawn two, Metamorphosis, and then Metamorphosis, and then Metamorphosis, the Alien Factor. Um, um, I ended up with with two partners that. You know, which I thought were friends, you know, again, that uh, I thought had my back and instead they stuck a knife in it. And so they didn't, they, at one point, because we had, um, uh, you know, the three of us were going to have equal say on, on doing a film. Uh, and so they didn't want to call it Deadly Spawn 2 because that film was too closely associated with me. So we decided to change the name to Metamorphosis, and and I said, okay, fine. They said, look, this is a multi million dollar project. You know, why should we associate it that much with a twenty thousand dollar film? Uh, like I said, the main reason was they just didn't want to have it associated with me totally. Sure. Um, then we found out when we were selling it that there was another film called Metamorphosis, which we don't want the hypodermic in the eye or something. Yes, it's, yes, it's, yes. That <laughs> film. We got to change this. So now we so we added the tagline "Metamorphosis: The Alien Factor" because we only had a lot of stuff done with with the word "metamorphosis" in it. 
Uh, so, you know, so we did that. And, uh, you know, again, it, it turned out to be a, a, another, you know, fiasco because, you know, when we took the film to sell it. Now, what? It's not a bad movie. You know, we had a lot of effects in it. You know, we had a decent budget. Oh, it's fantastic. And uh, all of a sudden we're getting these offers. But, you know, I'm trying to do my homework and find out who's who in the business. And, and these people that we're dealing with, I'm finding out are, 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 are crooks, but they're but they're offering more money than anybody else. And so my friend out there who was a lawyer told me, well, the way, the way they do that is these companies is they can offer you whatever they want. And what they do is let's say one company is saying, okay, we'll guarantee you $2 million over a, a year period or whatever. So the company comes and says, well, we'll give you $5 million. So they get the movie. Then all of a sudden they, tr they sell it and they try to make as much as they can from it. And now when it comes time to pay you, they just say, well, sue us. Ugh. So now to sue them in California, you've got to immediately, and again, we're talking about the early 90s, you know, 1988 to 90, that means you've got to send $50,000 off to a lawyer in California just to start this suit. So they know, you know, we're a bunch of young guys. We're not going to do that. You know, yeah. We're not going to really sue them. So that's what they did. I argued about it. My partners go, oh, no, no, no. We, we have, uh, you know, because we had a couple of guys on our team with lawyers too. Well, they'll take care of this and make ironbound contracts. I try to explain an ironbound contract. There's no such thing. Doesn't mean anything when the other when the other party says you don't like it, sue me. That's yeah. it. They got the they got more money. What, what are you I, gonna do? That's it. So so sure enough, it's exactly what happened. So so yeah, that turned out to be enough. But again, we we won a lot of awards with that film. The the Houston International Film Festival Award we won uh, came out on cable, did very well. Came out on Laserdisc. They sold out a Laserdisc half a dozen times. Um, you know, the film did good for the company. And so we ended up selling it, the domestic rights uh, in perpetuity to Lionsgate. So they own it. We, we, we still own, we still own the foreign rights to the movie, all, all foreign rights, but they own the domestic rights. Okay. So I have ha, just real quick before we get into regenerated man. Um, so does Lionsgate own, so Lionsgate owns it right now, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Are, it, did, are they planning on a disc? Do they even include you in talks or no idea i i had no communication with them since then a number of people have asked me if they're going to come out with some kind of you know big edition of it and i i don't know but we just don't have any communication they, they own it so we really have no say yeah so in, in in the thing which was another ridiculous situation but you you, you find out you learn that partners can really use that that's why after that film i started doing the films even though they were low low budget it was easier to do them myself, you know? So like regenerated man, I just did it myself. You know, I wrote the film with, with a friend of mine. I produced it. I directed it. You know, it was, it was just this way, you know, I had no one to answer to, but myself on it. Didn't have to worry about, you know, coming up with the uh, partners that stab you in the back. Well, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Regenerated man's another great one. Um, I love the use of all the stop motion in both of those films, Metamorphosis and Regenerated Man, because um, I know you're a big fan yourself of Ray yes. Harryhausen and, and all that. So, so so am I, and I'm also an effects guy too. So <laughs> that ah. yeah, so I really love all that stuff, um, and they, they are great additions to to the original film, even if they aren't officially you know sequels. Well, yeah, no, Re Regenerated Man had absolutely nothing to do with it at all. <laughs> I know. <laughs> The only reason that happened was was uh, I, I got a call in, in Japan. They released the, the three films as Deadly Spawn. Uh, they released Metamorphosis as Deadly Spawn 2. Metamorphosis, they, re they released The Regenerated Man as Deadly Spawn 3, The Regenerated Man. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they think they think there's three movies out there. Oh, man. It's like Control 2. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> The funny thing is I discovered Deadly Spawn on a VHS titled Alien 2, The Deadly Spawn Part 2. I was like, what movie really? is this? <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Yes. I, I grew up, like, seeing this movie at uh, actually a mutual friend of ours, uh, Tommy, uh, Tommy DeMichael, his house. And someone was like, yeah, this is a sequel to Alien. I was like, is it, though? <laughs> 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 so I grew up with this movie and having this weird urban legend around it that it was some kind of unofficial sequel to alien well that's why they changed the title i mean they 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 they, they changed the title to uh return of the aliens the deadly spawn thinking that that somehow someone was going to confuse this with with alien which was you know stupid but <laughs> yeah you know it's so they, egregious <laughs> they they still they still did it you know they said all right we got a great idea we're gonna we're gonna retitle we're gonna retitle the film and release it again as um return of the aliens the deadly spawn <sighs> whatever <laughs> yeah 
Where's Sigourney Weaver? <laughs> yeah. Just... Wait a second. We have like a running joke on our show where there's just that, you know, stereotypical uh, cigar chomping businessman in the uh, music industry that's like, they're not going to get it if it doesn't say aliens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. All aliens are the same. They won't know the difference. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's, but this is, this is the, the crazy crap you have to deal with. That's why I'm so happy I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> Something to look shit. forward to. <laughs> well, well, he, well, here's the problem. The, the, the problem is, is, is back then in, in the eighties into the nineties, I, I mean, we shot most of the films on film and you, you, you had to, if you shot on video, then you could hardly get a deal. You had to shoot, you know, stuff on film. And when you shoot stuff on film, you know, there's an investment to be made. You have to, you know, buy film stock. You have to develop film. You have to print film. You have to edit on film. You have to hire, you know, musicians. You got to have music. I mean, you had to put in a sizable, um, you know, amount of money to, to get this stuff unless you had connections. Nowadays, it doesn't matter. Any schmuck with a, with a uh, I phone can make a movie yeah and they, and they just give them away i mean you know lionsgate told me they've got thousands and thousands of films i haven't even watched yet in a room because the kids they don't care they're making them for 500 dollars because they get everything for free you get the editing equipment for free you get the music for free you get all the stuff for free and you put the film together on your stuff at home for nothing and it costs you a few hundred dollars and so they just give it away they don't they don't really care then it was a business we had we paid money and we had to make money you know, to do this, you had to pay off investors and do stuff. It wasn't like we were taking a couple hundred dollars out of a pocket and just that we didn't care what happened. Right, exactly. So, yeah. So it was a, it was a big thing. It took a long time for them to convince me to, to shoot, um, uh, on, uh, on video and, uh, or even into a computer. Um, and that we finally did with the, the film, um, destination fame. And then we took that and transferred that to 35 millimeter because oh, really, but yeah, by that time, uh, the cost had come down. So we actually took that film and transferred it to 35 millimeter and made a negative and, and you know, sh we could show it on the big screen. We had our premieres at a movie theater. Uh, so I just want to round, I want to round out some, some deadly spawn stuff. And then I want to, I want to talk about, uh, some of your publishing stuff. Um, so if you can do one thing, if you can go back and do one thing different on the production of deadly spawn, what, what would it be? Um, I would try to get more money. I mean, you know, <laughs> at the time, you got to remember, we were using the same lab that Sam Raimi used when he, he was doing uh, Evil Dead. Oh, yeah, yeah. At, at the same time. So uh, we had the same lab. So we were always looking and comparing footage uh, in, in New York. And, you know, I was, you know, jealous because he had a big budget. He had $150,000 to work with, <laughs> where, you know, we had less than $20,000 to work with. And, um, you know, he came in one time and he said, he said, Ted, he goes, I'm, I'm thinking of changing the name of the movie. Uh, and I said, well, to what? And he, well, cause at the, at the time the movie was called the book of the dead. Right. And so he goes, I'm thinking of change the title. I go, what? He goes, what do you think about this? Evil dead. And I went, <laughs> uh, I said, <laughs> stick with book of the dead. <laughs> Sh shows you what I know. <laughs> so, uh, so that was that. So we opened up right across from each other on Broadway. You know, he, he opened up on one side of the street. We were open up on the other. And I went to his premiere. He went to mine. You know, it was, uh, you know, it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of fun. Oh, that's so incredible. And, yeah. And now he and now he's doing Spider-Man and I'm here talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny though because it's like you know I, I don't know if Joe's gonna just kind of roll into these kind of questions but like just comparing those two films briefly just because you just told that anecdote obviously his film is like a gore fest but uh Deadly Spawn I feel like you guys the way you handled your gore is really awesome because like I just think of you know the head getting bitten off and the one woman's face getting ripped off just it still looks good to this day oh it looks amazing yeah, it, you know, again, we, we had to throw uh, the gore in because back then, uh, you know, in the 80s, the, the gore films w w were it. You know, you, you had to have, you know, and for foreign, you had to have some uh, a nudity in it. So now we're saying, oh, shit, we, we didn't think about that. What, what are we going to do? So, you know, we asked the mother, can you wear a seat through 90? <laughs> right. Uh, we asked Karen if she could have her top ripped off by the, the monster and then everybody was fine in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, you know, Karen Ty, the girl, you know, the blonde girl, uh, uh, all of a sudden she comes in, her agent, uh, says, agent says, um, uh, <laughs> you know, she's going to want more money if she has to show her tits. And I went, well, you know what? <laughs> Never mind. I said, we'll just, 
Well, tear, they, they let us tear down her dress to the top of her nipple, and that was, and that was, <laughs> and that was it. Because she was waiting for that big movie, and I'm wondering if she ever got it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you had the mother in there with the see-through gown. I think that uh, you know, you got your quota. That was that. I, as a matter of fact, I just uh, I was emailing with with uh, her with the mother um, um, a couple weeks ago when, when the book came out. You know, which was nice because I wanted to ask her a few questions about her name because she had like three different names, which I explained oh. in the book about how that all happened and how it all got you know messed up. But um, so yeah, so no, we're we're still thinking of you know because you know I do chill with theater twice a year, uh, the the convention, and um, talking to Kevin about doing a you know a Deadly Spawn reunion because there's still quite a few people that are you know sort of local you know that can that can come by. That would uh, be amazing. Yeah, so we're going to try me. I'm still here. You know, uh, John's still here. Doug is still, you know, here. Two or three of the actors are relatively local. So, you know, it's, it's you know, we're, we're talking about doing it and then COVID hit. <laughs> you know, so that yeah. was. Yeah. So you wrote, you, you write Chiller Magazine or, or were writing it, correct? Well, no, Chiller, I would just do the layout on, on Chiller. Oh, the layout, the layout, right. But you, uh, but you were always there. I remember you always being yeah. there. <laughs> and I, I, I love that. Yeah, we did Chiller. And then now I'm doing Monster Bay, uh, Monster bash because you know monster bash and and ron adams does the monster bash conventions which are which are fantastic as well and he does monster bash magazine so yeah i i uh, i lay out that magazine as well that's awesome are they are uh there's going to be a chiller soon no another convention uh, soon yeah yeah I, I think they have something up on the website I'm, I'm not sure whether they're going to do a show in uh october or it's going to be before that i I, you know, I haven't looked in a while yeah i'm i'm a, i always got a uh an eye on that and monster mania and things like that um because they're close um and they're usually amazing shows so hopefully when everything gets back to normal uh we can start doing that stuff again yeah yeah it better be better be soon yeah yeah right <laughs> i think we're getting there I know. Everybody is like, you know, let's get together. Let's get together. And, you know, half the people are scared. The other half are, you know, whatever. So, you know, we'll work it out. You know, hopefully, hopefully it'll be something this year. Fingers crossed. I got And toes. I got all my toes it's crossed, just, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's disgusting, but okay. Yeah, you know, I got to try any way I can, right? It It's even worse because he's got those web feet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, you, you published... You self-published uh, SPFX magazine, special, special effects magazine. Yeah, well, uh, well, d- during what was it? it? Was before the? I think it was before the films. I, I wanted to to get back into it again because the magazine, the first two, came out in the seventies, seventy six and seventy seven. Right. And then I took the break, you know, to make the movie. So, you know, a- after a certain stream of movies, we did Dudley Spawn, then we did Metamorphosis, then The Regenerated Man, then Vampire Victims from Venus, mm-hmm. and um, well, in the last couple of weeks, you know, I did. Destination Fame, Hell on Earth, This Thing of Ours, which is, you know, a mob film. And um, then I wanted to go back to do the magazine again. So I, you know, picked up on that. And, um, you know, so I, I published up to issue 10, you know, of that. And then, you know, it, it's a it's a it's very expensive, you know, when you do these magazines, because I want them to be good quality. So I want, you know, color and good, nice paper. And so they were, they were costing me anywhere between four or $5,000, you know, each. Wow. And, it's a pain even to ship them when you got to ship them all over when you were dealing with like, you know, diamond and all these places, you know, now I think it's a little bit better, but back then, well, now actually I'm saying it's worse back then, you know, they would, if they ordered 2000 copies, they'd say, all right, now you got to put them into boxes and you're going to send a hundred here or 500 here, 200. It, it was just a nightmare. Uh, but at least you got issues back if they didn't sell. Now they order 3000 magazines and then they say, okay, well, we sold 2000 and, a thousand you're not getting paid for and that's it you wouldn't get them back or anything to be able to sell them as you know old issues nothing you know you don't get anything what? It's that's just, insane it's absolutely horrible so i just said you know the hell with this so i, I said you know what i have all of these uh uh for years i've been uh, collecting candid photos you know behind the scenes photos from films all the way from the 30s up into the 60s i said let me make that like a coffee table book that i could publish myself through amazon and um It'd be fun. But as I was doing, I said, you know what, why don't I take some of, because, you know, uh, uh, SPFX came out in the seventies. I said, let me take some of these old articles. And I know people that have books and articles, you know, old stuff that probably the new, like you said, the new people haven't seen, seen before. And I'll start a new series uh, of books called Candid Monsters. And so I started doing that. And then all of a sudden it took off. I did, I did one, two, three, and then eight, nine, and now I'm on the 10th one. So, um, 
So that's good. So those are on those are on eBay and those are on Amazon. And you can you know you can go on Amazon.com, put in Candid Monsters. You can look at them. You know, it shows you the pages. You know, to, to get an idea. And I finally did the making of the Deadly Spawn. You know, I did a book on that. So pe- people were asking about it for a long time, and I said, you know what? Let me put something together. So it's a full color, you know, full color book, uh, making the Deadly Spawn, and that's that's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a fantastic book, by the way. Uh, it, oh, thanks. And you know, just between like all the interviews, and you got the you know the foreword by Fred Olin Ray, and you got Michelle Bauer in there, and the interviews with John and uh, Tim. I mean, and all the photos in there, unbelievable. All the uh, behind the scenes stuff, and and all the different video covers and posters and stuff. It's it's really 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 neat. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, no, I tried to put in as, as much as I could. Yeah, it's really good stuff. So you're a big Harryhausen fan, with that we've established. What is your favorite movie monster? Movie monster? Yeah. Oh, geez, geez, I don't know. I mean, there's 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 so many good ones. I mean, I all, all the so many of the Harryhausen stuff. You know, the Cyclops is always great, and the you know, the Emir from Twenty uh, Million Miles to Earth. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of the the early uh, uh, Beast from Twenty Thousand Fathoms. There's a lot of great you know movie monsters out there. You know, of, of the older stuff. You know, newer stuff. You know, I don't even know. I mean, I like. Well, yeah, I don't even know. What's what's the newer stuff? What, what, what kind of great movie monsters do we have? I mean, Cloverfield. It, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, now they're coming up with these. You know, the you know uh, Godzilla versus Kong. Mm-hmm. You know, right. Which I, which I just I was so pissed off. I love three D movies. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I have I have almost every one that they they made uh, at home. You watch them; they're fantastic. Yeah. And now with the COVID thing, they weren't releasing anything in three D anymore. And um, they just, I was looking and I'm looking at the trailer for Kong, uh, Godzilla versus Kong. And I'm saying, oh, the, fir- the first one, the other Kong was 3D. I said, this one, I guarantee you, just by looking at the trail, this was meant to be 3D. Oh, yeah. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And all of a sudden, they have the dates when it's coming out. And one theater here actually has it in 3D. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I immediately got tickets for that. I think it's like in two weeks or something. So yeah, that's it's gonna be fun. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I guess that rolls into my next question. Like, which, so do you have any movies that you really enjoyed, like from the past ten years uh, or so? Jeez, what? I mean, like I said, I enjoyed the the Kong film. It was was kind of cool. I mean, Peter Jackson's King Kong was you know was different. It was interesting, but it wasn't it wasn't King Kong. I, you know, I, I don't know what they, they they still even though you know people like Peter Jackson are saying they're big fans of the um of the original right he he didn't remake the original he re he remade the 1976 kong yes exactly <laughs> sure did. and he didn't he he didn't remake king kong and king kong the girl was terrified of the of the ape the whole thing she didn't fall in love with him she wasn't trying to save him she wasn't doing cabaret for him yeah and, and now they go ice skating no no that that happened in the 76 kong and then that's the one he remade because that was the story in there is is you know, they cared about each other. That never happened to the, the original King Kong. And King Kong was always designed to be a um, sort of a hybrid type creature. It was never supposed to be a big mountain gorilla. You know, so it's like, you know, these people are doing Kong now. They're just making it a big gorilla. And, and Kong was, and if you look at some of the old notes uh, uh, that Cooper had or whatever on that, he, they just, they, I have pictures. They were never sure how, just how human they wanted to make it. They want to make like a missing link type thing. So some of the con- concepts of Kong, he was even more human. So, you know, Kong wasn't to me ever meant to be just a big mountain gorilla. And that's what they've done with like the new mighty Joe Young. And right. Peter Jackson's Kong. I, uh, you know? I, I won't call him out by name, but a mutual friend of ours, uh, Said on his podcast, ask ah, Skrittle say his name, uh, Matt over on uh, Monsters Never Die said that was his favorite Peter Jackson movie. And I'm sorry, Matt, I love uh, Peter Jackson, and that movie is good, but it's not Dead Alive or Lord of the Rings. So if you hear this, it's just shouting that out for him. <laughs> does his voice always go up an octave like that when he does it? Oh, yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, no, don't get me wrong. Kong is not a bad film. Uh, you know, Peter Jackson did an amazing job. I mean, the action sequences in there are just, oh, just yeah. incredible. Yeah. I mean, animation is, is phenomenal but you know it just you know he didn't he professed to be a big kong fan and he just did not remake the you know the same movie you know yeah it was definitely a lot more like the jessica lang version for sure 
Yeah, I mean, making the character be an asshole was was you know to me a, a, a mistake. I mean, you know, the lead guy you you want to be, you know, yeah, he could have been a business guy trying to make some money, but not make him an ass. But sure, you know, whatever. I just like that halfway through he's like, you know what I haven't done? I haven't shown people getting eaten by giant bugs very slowly. So let's just do that now <laughs> for ten minutes. Well, that was his big thing, trying to you know do the uh, the uh, the lost spider pit. Yes, scene from, yes, um, yeah. right, right. He, he, he tried to actually do it, which is fine. I yeah. Mean, the scene was good. I don't like it when they do stupid shit. Like, you know, there's five bugs on a guy, so someone aims a Tommy gun at him and just starts blasting with his eyes. <laughs> his eyes closed and just happens to hit all the bugs. I'm like, oh, please. Uh, <laughs> that man should look like Swiss cheese. That stuff just annoys the hell out of me. But, you know, but, but whatever. But, uh, yeah, I, know, I just watched the It movies, um, uh, which were okay. You know, again, yeah. No big deal. There yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, there isn't too much that, that stands out saying, oh, this is, you know, if, I, I mean, I remember when, you know, this is probably even older, but I enjoyed The Matrix when it came out. You know, that that series I thought was, uh, you know, was really good. You know, they did a nice job with that. But uh, any, uh, any any horror flicks in particular jump out at you? Uh, I don't know. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we were just talking about it before, uh, like the something like the witch. Like, is that something? I mean, I don't know if that if you're interested in that. No, nah, I, I really don't watch any any of those. You know, type. It's like it seems like once you've seen one, you've seen them all. You know, how, how many times can they have you know someone's mouth CGI extended or their body backwards or levitate in the air or I mean, ah. don't don't dunk on that 2005 trend. I, I hear you 1,000 percent on that one. Yeah, so there's not too many of those that I that I watch. I mean, I, sometimes I'll catch them. You know, if I see something, I'll watch it on you know on TV. But that's about it. Shutter has been a kind of a, a great place to discover stuff that you have never heard of and suddenly find yourself very invested in. Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I went to the movies I think two or three times, and, and we went to go see uh, the new Wonder Woman. Which yeah, you know, to me was a disappointment. And uh, what I what I just see? What I just see? Oh, uh, and then a tenant film. Oh you know, yeah, because you know I I love that guy. Uh, you know he, he he makes such great movies uh, like Memento or whatever. But tenant, I I he just seemed like he was going out of his way to try to be confusing on purpose. You know, so I mean I watched the movie and I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> he's got to top every film, you know, ever since Inception. Then he did uh, Interstellar. He's got to keep making it more confusing. Oh, right. there's a movie I like. Interstellar was one. Yeah, it was that, good. That film I, I really enjoyed. Um, you know, the story was was just was good. And, you know, I, I enjoyed Interstellar. That uh, that one I can say. But but uh, but this thing, I'm like, what the hell? I, I'm, <laughs> you know, people were leaving. I was in a theater with maybe 50 people, and everyone was leaving saying, what the hell did we just see? You know, they know- <laughs> And when you have to, when you can, you know, when most of his films, you'll 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 leave the the theater saying, "Oh wow, that was like uh, so many levels of cool shit in there." But this one, people just like confused. They're just like, "What the hell were we watching?" They didn't even know. And I could follow those movies pretty easily. And I'm watching this thing going, "I'm not even sure." I think I dozed off probably twice. <laughs> I think stuff like that is the kiss of death for 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 new ideas. You know, you, they put out something like that and that's supposed to be, you know, new and different, and then they kind of just fuck it up because it's too difficult to follow. You know what I mean? And that kind of turns everybody off. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, whenever you have to start, you know, going on the Google and reading about what the movie meant, you know, you got to go to the Wikipedia to figure it yeah, out. Yeah, like, you know, you know, you're in trouble. Yeah. Also, using time travel is uh, dicey, and then when you overcomplicate it, you're definitely going to leave people going like, "I don't know what you're doing." Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's complicated enough as it. Uh... As it is. Uh, speaking of movies, uh, now I, I read your book, and uh, at the end, you, you talk a little bit about uh, possibly the the Deadly Spawn prequel happening with uh, John Raymond. Is yeah. that now? You said you were retired, so is that something that you kind of want to come out to do, or, or or? Yeah, yeah. If we can, you know, if we can do it. I mean, we we came up with some ideas, and he's he's writing uh, a screenplay. Um, my friend uh, that works for a, a comic book company uh, just called me up and they said they might be interested in doing like a graphic uh, novel series of Deadly Spawn. So we're oh, that would be awesome. coming up with a, a simpler um, a story that uh, will go into like a, a prequel and then like a reimagining of Deadly Spawn and then a, uh, a sequel to Deadly Spawn with, with like, you know, new characters, new monsters, you know, and, and you know, new stuff to try to see if we can, you know, reboot it a bit. So uh, we're, we're talking about that. And then 
Uh, you know, because I told him, I said, don't go crazy with the movie stuff now. With this COVID stuff, it's just, it's too difficult. Uh, sure. I said, you've got to wait another year or two before, you know, people are ready for that. But to do a, um, you know, a series of comics or graphic novels or something like that and possibly sell that to a studio, that, that's an interesting idea. So we're, we're looking into doing that. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I remember because uh, I reread the comic again that was included on the uh, Synapse DVD. That's actually in the book as well. Yes. Um, and I just thought that was so cool, like, um, how you kind of had it as, like, two, like a, like a war uh, 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 of these aliens, and they, like, send the aliens, the, you know, they send the actual deadly spawn. They're almost like, uh, you know, I think Ridley Scott ripped you off there with uh, his Prometheus idea. Yeah, well. Because, <laughs> because. It's, it's happened before. Because, uh, the you know, the deadly spawn were created specifically to kind of wipe out, uh, uh, you know, planets basically which i thought was a really cool idea i like that yeah use this as a weapon um you know, like i said if, if we go into the comic we're going to probably do a um a simpler story i, I had something that I, I had written for what was going to be a deadly spawn 2 um where i had the you know a bunch of kids are up in a mountain and they hit a little minor earthquake you know there's a cave and they go in there and they find this uh spawn like thing and they they think it's it hatches and they bring it in and they take it into the barn and they sort of like start feeding it. It's like this little thing. They keep it as like a pet. And, um, you know, the father is a, uh, you know, scientist who has a lab in his house and he works in there. And, um, uh, so anyway, the same type of thing happens. The thing gets out, you know, at night and it comes back there and it's, um, at the end, there's like two, it gets big again. And then they end up making an artificial creature like to fight it. And so at the end, there's like a battle of these two big wow. monsters. That sounds so, fantastic. I, I need so, that. I need that stat. <laughs> we'll see. You know, but, you know, as much as I, I hate to use CGI, I think we might have to um, do a hybrid. I mean, there's going to be all kinds of effects. There'll be stop motion. There'll be there'll be puppets. There'll be you know full size animatronics. You know, I like making a combination of the uh, of those uh, those things. You got to keep it practical for the most part. That that's yeah. That's that's where that's where all that good stuff is. You know, if you can. Yes. Well, I know enough makeup people. <laughs> well, that's so, good. Yeah. No. We're, <laughs> we'll definitely do that so yeah no so these are some projects you know we'll see what happens and, and i'm still you know doing the books and you know just uh taking it taking it easy doing that <laughs> there you go man having some cigars and and living it up that's that you know what i was going to actually suggest because i was at our cigar club today i was going to take this thing in there and I, I didn't know how crowded it would be, but I was going to do this there so we could be having a martini and a cigar while I was talking. <laughs> oh, <about laughs> that's lovely. Doing this because, again, I thought this was a video thing. I didn't know sure. it was just audio. That wouldn't have made any sense now. It's a good thing I didn't do it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. We'll have you on again. We'll do the video. We'll do the martinis. We'll have the cigars. We'll do the whole nine. Perfect. <laughs> and perfect. hopefully we could do it in person soon, you know? <laughs> yes. You know, I, I can't wait till it gets back. We're all, everybody, all the chiller, you know, gang are chomping at the bit to get together again and, uh, you know, do our, do our nightly, you know, cigar and tequila fest. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Uh, hopefully it's not too crazy of a question, but. Uh-oh, here comes trouble. <laughs> uh, in the movie, In Deadly Spawn, I like this idea you guys implemented with that these aliens can't see anything. Um, and. I just was curious how you guys kind of came to that conclusion. Was that from like a a budgetary reason? Was that just something you guys wanted through the story? Like, how did you come to that? No, I just thought it would be kind of cool when when I designed you know the creature in the, in the beginning. I had some, um, you know, I had a, I, I always wanted to do something with a lot of teeth and no mm -hmm. eyes. Um, that was three heads with you know tentacles or arms, and so that was the first thing that I I drew, and that's the thing I gave to John. And when we were doing the film, and, and well, as you read the book, you know, he just said, ah, you know, a, a, you know, a guy in a rubber suit, even though at the time I thought it was it was a pretty interesting idea because what I wanted to have is I wanted to have a guy in the suit, uh, but there's, and his head would, the, the main head would be over his head, which he would, you know, use his either, you know, his jaw to articulate. And then there were two side heads on the side that people would operate from behind so they could make them turn and move. And then there was two other people behind them that would operate these arms that would, that would come out. So I just told John, I said, look, as long as the thing has three heads full of teeth uh, and the uh, pincher arms that come around or whatever, I said, you know, see what happens. So he just took out the legs, dropped the trunk to the, to the bottom, 
you know, had the three big heads with the arms and you know, he did a number of different designs. Some of them I just thought were too impractical because, you know, of the budget. Uh, but he came up with that one. And I said, you know, I said, that's great. And I said, Hey, you're building it. So if you could build it <laughs> it's on for you. our humongous budget of 500 bucks, you know, whatever it was, if, if you could build that, we'll do that instead of the guy in the suit. And and that's, so that uh, came out that way, but no, from the beginning, I always want to have it um, open its mouth and sense things. Uh, and just you know hear sounds and and like a bat and it would just bounce off this like membrane in his mouth. There were tons of stuff that um, we had planned for the film. We just didn't have the budget to do. Sure. Uh, one was of course explaining that have the mouth unhinge and open like a radar thing and have sounds bounce off it when it was listening. Oh. Uh, the other we had a birthing scene where the stomach would open up and these things would would come out or parts of it would separate from the creature that would be monsters. Uh, we had to open a door. There was one. Why did the kids just run out the door? Well, they did that. They opened the door, but they were all spawns interconnected in front of the door. These are things we just we just literally couldn't afford to do. And uh, and even at the end, um, we couldn't afford to do the ending I wanted, which was you know the big head coming out of the ground. So we were going to instead have after the film was over, everybody sits down and, you know, now they see another meteor come down and then another and another, and the sky is filled with meteors. <laughs> and so that was going to be the ending that we were going to compromise. And, and Tim is one that told me, he says, what's the ending you really want? And I told him, he goes, I'll build that set for you in the barn and we'll do it all for a few hundred dollars. And I said, what? And so that's what happened. So we, we finally got the, you know, the ending I wanted. Yeah. Well, it's funny when, when you remember when, um, I, the phone rang off the hook when when uh, uh, Jurassic Park came out because you know I, I the gag with the hand out of the mouth. Oh my! Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I wasn't gonna bring that up, but I immediately was thinking Mr. Arnold. Obviously, that oh, came yeah. after, but yeah, my the phone started ringing, the email started coming in. Steven Spielberg ripped your arm. I was like, <laughs> yeah, I sure he did. He definitely saw it. I think maybe. I I believe he did. I believe he did. Of course, it, absolutely. I mean, I've seen all of his films. Why wouldn't he see mine? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and again, Deadly Spawn, the film itself, has just been such an inspiration uh, to me and kind of my career path and things like that, uh, along with Evil Dead and Bad Taste and, and, and all of those kinds of, you know, grassroots, made-for-nothing films that really have just stood the test of time and are, and are still enjoyed today by so many people. And, and really, if you haven't seen uh, Deadly Spawn, you definitely need to see it. Um, it is one of those essential uh, B horror movies, and they need to buy the book. And that too, I was just getting to that. And you get you get the, <laughs> you get that film, and you get the companion piece, which is making the 1980 sci-fi monster cult classic, The Deadly Spawn, uh, written by uh, Mr. Uh, Ted Boas himself. That's right. You could do that. So yeah. So that's like I said. That's. That's about it. That, that's all I'm doing. I'm just concentrating. I'm going to probably do at least maybe another five or six uh, uh, books on the Candid Monsters thing. And um, and I, I do have a, another book in mind for the rest of the films, for, to do Metamorphosis and, you know, Regenerate Man, Hell on Earth and Vampire Vixens of Venus and all that stuff. But I don't know. I'll, I'll see what happens. It's already done. I mean, it's written. I just got to pretty much put it together and throw the, you know, the pictures in there. I'll be first in line for those somewhere <laughs> down the road. I'll, I'll do that. But it's, it's, you know, when you start getting into a lot of the, the, you know, the crazy stuff about, you know, how people ripped you off and, you know, crooks and scumbags and, and shit, it, it, it's really tough, you know, to keep reading that over and over again, you know, when, because when you're putting it together on the film. So, you know, I hate to really, you know, just be calling out, you know, people about that stuff. And uh, so I, I wasn't sure, but, what the hell? Might as well put it out. I mean, it, the stories need to be told, you know? Yes, they do. <laughs> we appreciate them. Serves as a warning for the for the rest of us. You know? Yes. That's exactly what it that's exactly what it'll do. And and you know, I I I that's how I get most of my information. Like we we talk to uh, Jeff Lieberman and we talk to um Graydon Clark and in all of and and a, and a few others and and they had a lot of insight to that so it was it's been a pleasure um, reading uh, you know your takes and getting your takes uh, on the industry and and filmmaking in general so it's been super helpful yes thank you thank you it's great so uh, so yeah uh, so where can everybody find you uh, just on you know uh, there's the website I have uh, thedeadlyspawn.com uh, and you know you, you'll be able to find you know the information about the 
probably the book stuff and there's a whole bunch of stuff. pinballs i collect pinball machines so there's there's stuff on there so everything is under uh the deadly spawn.com uh, there's a whole bunch of different uh things on there so you can find most of the stuff on there again the books you can find on on um ebay or uh, amazon.com you can go there and check them out and uh you know, that's it excellent that sounds great all right, Ted. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's been a, a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at Chiller or uh, or somewhere else and have a nice cigar. <laughs> Absolutely. I can't wait. All right. Take care. All right, buddy. Thank you. So that's it. We hope you enjoyed that interview. And make sure you head over to thedeadlyspawn.com, Amazon, or eBay and pick up Ted's new book, Making the 1980s Science Fiction Horror Monster Cult Classic, The Deadly Spawn. And while you're at it, why don't you grab some of his other books in his Candid Monster series. If you want some more good, bad, and god-awful movie goodness, head over to moviedumpsterpodcast.com and follow us on all of your favorite social media and streaming platforms. You can also head on over to our Patreon page and sign up for the 2 5 or $10 tiers for monthly exclusive content, or drop by our merch store and grab yourself uh, some non-committal swag. Yeah, and for no money at all, you can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts to support your favorite show. 